Hey, welcome everyone to the Sky Tech Control. I am Victor Chu today with my special guest. Please welcome my guest, Talia Holler. Welcome to the Sky Tech One Show. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk drones, tech. You're a drone pilot, you're a photographer, videographer, also uh, specializing in AI, especially uh, more specifically in the medical field. Is that correct? Yeah, so my full-time job is as a strategy consultant at Deloitte where I focus on AI in healthcare. Um, there's lots of opportunity to kind of revolutionize and transform the healthcare sector, um, especially when it comes to integrating tech. So it's a really interesting field to be in. What I am currently working on, and keep in mind, so I work for um, a large consulting firm, so there's tons of different work that we're doing all of the time. Um, the work that I'm focused on is uh, the company that I work for, Deloitte, is actually developing a suite of AI healthcare solutions um, for a ton of different healthcare clients, everyone from providers who actually provide services, you know, doctors, hospitals, um, to the payers, so the health insurance companies that go ahead and pay the claims patients submit, um, even to pharmacies. And so what I do, coming from a business and finance background, is actually look at the business case for integrating AI into the healthcare client, um, what that looks like, how long it takes, what the implementation will require. And then I also do a lot of marketing, um, which actually plays into kind of the photography and videography stuff that I do on this side. And I do solution development as well. So and is, is using AI kind of like, hey, taking different data points, data sets, from let's say your blood tests, your your physical, and using some sort of software to connect all these and 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 put it into a machine and then generate some some sort of prediction or some sort of forecast. Is that how it works? Yeah. So that's a great point. So AI is a buzzword right now. I would say especially in the healthcare industry, and there are some solutions that are more built on business logic. So if A then B. Um, true AI does in integrate a lot of different data, structured and structured, and what that means is structured data might be in Excel where everything is labeled, and unstructured data might be a doctor's notes where they have scribbled all over the place and it's like their language, and how can a machine take that and actually make sense and use that in some way? Integrate all of that into um, data that is fed into an algorithm or an AI process and basically um, the AI is going to look at it without business logic that humans have applied and be able to come out with an output. Um, right. But we're doing that on a much more complex scale, such as um, reading radiology and pathology slides. So to be able to tell whether or not someone has skin cancer, that's something that AI will probably eventually be able to do. I see. Um, that's pretty cool. Do you think, you know, in one sentence, do you think in the future, there's going to be a robot that will replace doctors and then they'll just kind of go into the medical examination room and then like just take, you know, replace the doctor. Is that is that the future? Let's take that one step further. Why are you in a medical examination room? Why? I mean, just come to your house, right? They'll just a little robot will just come through your door and just do that. I don't right? have it on you. So like this, for example, <laughs> this is the wearable. Right. I use it for sleep, but I think that in the future, the data will be 24 seven and all integrated. So now I want to segue into your creative uh, endeavors. You know, you're also a professional photographer, videographer, FAA certified drum pilot and Airbnb experienced photographer. Uh, you're all <laughs> these things. Can you just let us know a little bit about that? Um, so it actually started with modeling. Um, I really loved being in front of the camera and I had all of these shots that I wanted to get. And um, actually it got me into videography first because my original idea was um, I was a nomadic consultant, which I'm still a consultant, but due to COVID, I have not been super nomadic lately. I've been doing more of like extended stays in various places. Um, but I thought it would be really cool to capture the traveling nomadic consultant lifestyle because I know travel is really popular with millennials and a lot of younger people, but a lot of people don't think of the nomadic, consult nomadic consulting life as something that they can do. 
So I invested in the camera equipment that I wanted and was just starting to learn how to use it. Um, I just kind of started shooting like anything that was available to me. I uh, was really into shooting real estate. Uh, it was nice because the homes didn't move. So it's like a lot easier sometimes to get the footage because you can try as many times as you want and no one's going to get bored. You can just shoot around. So I was going through my neighborhood and just taking different pictures of the houses. I was turning my own house into, well, I guess my family's house because when COVID originally hit being nomadic, I was like, oh, okay, I'll just go stay with my family for a few weeks. And then, um, that basically turned into a couple months because COVID lasted a lot longer than I think we all initially thought it would. Charlie, can you tell me a little bit about your Airbnb experience photographer? And I think some people might have the misconception as the photographer that takes the Airbnb um, apartments, you know, the spaces. Uh, is that true or is there more to it? So I don't take pictures of apartments uh, for Airbnb. What I do is I have my own experience on there and it was, it changes based on my location. But in Hawaii, where I started it, it was um, pro or Hawaii photo tour with pro photographer. Um, and basically what I was doing was taking one or small groups of one person or small groups of friends out and doing a little photo shoot with them in some really cool scenic locations. Um, around Waikiki, which was my home base there when I was living in Oahu. Um, mm -hmm. And it was super fun. Yeah. And how did people find you? How did they find out about your service? So I put up the, the experience on Airbnb and I honestly had no idea if people were going to bite on it or not. I just thought, why not try it? Because it seemed like a good way to make side money. And I really wanted to improve at my photography. And so I was also working from 5 to 2 p.m. every day. So I was getting off work really early in the afternoon and had this huge block of time where I was like, all right, we can do sunset photo shoots every day. Price and what, 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 made your, what made your tour, uh, you know, your experience different from the other photography tours? Um, just the locations that I was going to. So I was taking them on like a quick hike. My idea was kind of with photos in mind because I was thinking about people out there like me who like to do fun things and then capture them and then put them on their Instagram. Like I really like capturing myself in the location. So I wanted to take them to a couple of cool locations where what they would be able to capture themselves in kind of the spirit of Hawaii and then share those with your friends. Because I was thinking my market is probably going to be people looking for Hawaii travel photos to share probably on Instagram. Um, and so I took them on a hike. It was like a very short hike uh, to get some of those hiking travel photos. And then we went over to a beautiful sunset spot with a great view of the water. And then we actually went down to the beach. This was the tour. People just really wanted pictures of themselves on the beach, which was fine with me. That's easier than hiking around and like taking people to different places. Um, so I was definitely fine with that. And so it did end up we were just taking photos on the beach, which was easy and fun. And I got to see the sunset and take different pictures of the sunset every day. Wow, that's like that. That's like a lot of people's dream job, right? It's taking sunsets in Hawaii and getting paid for it. Exactly. Yeah, it's really nice. I felt like I always got great tans on those days too, because you're out there for a couple hours, just like full sunlight, taking pictures, like you're distracted, not really thinking about it. Um, but when I put the ad up, I was kind of shocked because the first one that booked it, and I literally put it up a week before I got there for the week that I got there. I had right. never even been to Hawaii before. I did research and then put the ad up and then somebody booked it. And at first I was like, oh, I'm so excited. This is great. And then I was like, wow, I've never been to this place. Like I didn't expect them to book it so quick. I really hope the tour works out um, because I still need to do it. So that was like, as soon as I got to Hawaii, I went and did the tour that I had described to make sure that it was doable. <laughs> um, it wasn't. So that was like part of the reason I was like, oh, because I asked her to describe like what she wanted. 
And she was like, I really just want pictures of myself on the beach. So I'm like, okay, this is great. We're just going to go to the beach because that tour was like way too much work. Um, so you, you, honestly, you, you created a tour before you even went to Hawaii. You, you even, or even ever been to Hawaii. <laughs> and because, then, and then you, and then when you got there, you're like, oh crap, this, this, this is not going to work. <laughs> But also, I thought I didn't honestly when I put the listing up. I thought no one's gonna book this here. If they do, it'll take a couple <laughs> weeks. Later. I didn't expect someone to book the same day I put it up, and then not one person booked, but like four people booked. And I was like, oh my gosh, there goes my first week in Hawaii. Like this is <laughs> crazy. So that's when I was like, all right, it's time to raise prices. Um, so I got to raise prices really quickly, and then I also um, after I had. So I did the first week and it was a ton of work because every single day I was going out, taking photos of people, coming home, uploading them, editing them, sending them over because I really wanted to get photos to people soon. Cause, and so I started doing it just once a week and I usually booked up every single week and then I would just leave the uh, space open. Once someone booked, I would take down the space for that week which actually worked to my advantage because then Airbnb changed my status to like this experience sells out very quickly, which wasn't something I knew would happen, but I thought it looked really nice for my profile. <laughs> Sold out tickets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> that's how the algorithm works, I guess. So. Yeah, that's cool. And and what about your drone? You know, we, we, this channel is called Sky Tech One and it wouldn't be called Sky Tech One if it didn't have you know, sky, right? Drones. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you have, I know you have the Mavic two pro, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And you know, what do you do with your drone? I, I do see a lot of very cool Hawaii shots with your drone. Um, tell me about your drone. How did you get into the drone? And I think you mentioned earlier that you got a part for part of, um, partially because of real estate, right? Yeah. Why did I get the drone? Um, I love the shots that drones produce. I feel like it's a really unique viewpoint. I also like, I want to make a documentary in my future. That's one thing that feels like a fun challenge. Um, I'd like to make that about the future of health. I think that drones, when you're telling a story, are really good for establishing shots. So I really love like the aspect of having a drone uh, for the purposes of like video storytelling. Um, and then also I do a lot of things by myself and the drones are really good for solo shots mm. um, because I can just control it in one hand and fly it exactly where I want in another hand or, um, you know, it's flying. So I liked it from like the individual traveler or like the solo travel perspective. What have I done with it? So I actually think there's a lot more ways I could monetize the drone if I wanted to. Um, but, you know, time, time is time to me is more important than money. So I haven't done a lot of the monetization things that maybe What about I like a drony for for uh, these tourists? You know, you can call it Yeah, exactly. Sunset drony, so like, right? There's like so many ways that you could make money on Airbnb with drone, especially because a lot of other people aren't doing that. It's just not something uh, that I have done yet, but I think people would be interested and I think like especially if you were like, I think there'd be a really interested male audience for that, too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because I've noticed they, like, tend to flock to the drone. They are very interested in learning about it. <laughs> say, oh, I want one. So I think, like, something like that would be really popular. Um, and even couples, I think, really like that stuff. But I just haven't yet. What I was using the drone for, um, I wouldn't say I monetize, like, using the drone a ton in Hawaii. But... I kind of used it in to get to cool experiences. So I would like offer my services as a drone person to be able to go on like fun boat rides where they just wanted footage of like me circling the boat with my drone. Yeah. Um, and so I would just do that and then get a free like 50 to a hundred dollar boat ride. So like to me, that was awesome. Cause now here I am just, you know, on a boat with a bunch of people having a good time and I get to do the thing that I really love. Um, I did have some close calls with it because one time, um, so this was like something on my part that I should have been more familiar with, but I was under the impression that 
the drone could that the drone because you know it can only go so far from you with like its native settings or like the settings that come with it um i'm pretty sure you can program those to go further but i just haven't really needed to do that so anyways we're on this boat i let it go the boat is going like pretty fast in the right direction and the drone is following along and all of a sudden it stops and it won't go past mm. its spot that's like 400 meters or whatever from the starting the point and wall. i'm like oh god because i had thought that it was 400 meter meters from the remote control for some reason so i'm like oh no so i'm like running up to the boat captain being like hey we really need to turn the boat around like my drone can't go <laughs> past there like so we're just so luckily they were really nice. They turned the boat around, which actually the shot looked great because the drone's like just sitting there pretty far away at that point. Um, so it got like this really cool thing of uh, the boat turning and coming back to get it. Uh, but it was a little bit unresponsive when I was coming down, like the hover functionality wasn't working. And I'm like on like a boat that's like moving a little bit. So I'm like trying to catch it in the air. It's not hovering. <laughs> everyone's like oh wow she really knows what she's doing and i'm just like <laughs> oh my god i feel like someone's head's gonna get chopped off with the propellers right now so it was a little bit nerve-wracking and um, that experience so after that it was more doing like stable boat shots and like planned movements with the boats um but it was you know learning a <laughs> learning experience but the one instance that was like the most awkward. And I actually learned from it um, because especially like I've noticed some older people might have a little bit of animosity towards the drones. So uh. I was flying my drone in this area where I guess this woman was meditating and she really <laughs> hates hated drones. I think she hated them before she saw me with it. And I was also with somebody else. Um, a guy that also had a drone. So we're flying our drones and this woman just starts yelling at us about how we're disturbing her peace and blah, blah, blah. And I did notice that uh, my reaction and his reaction were really different. I think like, it obviously depends on the person, but I did feel like mine was like, oh, okay, like, let me take the drone down. And he was like, it's a free country. Like I'm flying my <laughs> drone. So I was like, wow. But it, it was a good learning lesson because I realized after that, like, I wanted to ask people around just in case, like, give them an opportunity to say if it made them uncomfortable, you know, just. You seem to have a very uh, interesting job at the, in the corporate world, but you also have expertise and um, success in the creative world. So how does one like you straddle the corporate and the creative worlds and, and and still be successful how do you balance the you know the work work life between those two well i like to be busy um uh, i think that so i've done creative in the corporate world and i've done creative in the freelance world and there's pros and cons to both um so that's kind of an interesting tangent in itself. Well, I think there's a lot of things that translate really well across both. Like I think I think within both like management of other people and like just kind of networking and business skills are really handy. Um, and I think there's a lot of things that I take from my <coughs> corporate job that I bring into the creative professional work that I do that's really appreciated. Like I think just timeliness and like um, professionalism professionalism that I bring into the creative side of things is like really appreciated. Like I hear from clients like, wow, you're so organized and your turnaround is so quick. Um, and I think like a lot of that just comes from being in a corporate world where like organization and quick turnarounds is really expected. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of nice. In terms of like the actual time balance, I just really love photography and videography and I kind of, I, I'm lucky enough to be in a place where it's not my full-time job so I can really choose the projects that I want to do and in doing so, I can keep it something that I'm doing only projects that I really love and find interesting so it never feels uh, like it's so fun that I want to do it. Like it's not right. a burnout for me to work you know, eight or nine hours a day at my corporate job and then go spend four or five hours doing 
something related to photography or videography. It more of like gives me life um, and like makes me really excited. But I think if I was doing something that was a lot like aimed at making a lot more money in the creative side of things, that might change a little bit. Because when I did start to go that direction, I felt the burnout really quickly because having right. two jobs was a lot. Or to, for example, like when I did a full week of like photo shoots every single day in Hawaii and I was like, wow, like I could be making really great side <laughs> income, um, you know, to the tune of like probably thirty to $50,000 extra a year if I wanted to, but I don't want to take photo shoot, do photo shoots every day because it's a lot of work and I think that I need more time to just decompress and like literally just free time to be like, what do I feel like doing today? Um, so, and you know, part of the thing with creative work too, is that even though passion projects are fun, it's not to say that there's not times where they're a little stressful or um, intimidating maybe, or you feel the pressure to perform for the client. Uh, but I think that's pretty inevitable. So for me, I just try to focus on the passion and then also focus more on the, you know, giving the client the best quality I can give them and less on myself and my own anxieties about, is this good enough? Um, or, you know, I really feel like I don't have enough time to do this, but I have to do it right now. So here we go. So um, I think overall though, like keeping the creative side like passion first has really helped me balance the two. And what about struggles or challenges that you've encountered as a woman, uh, whether it's, you know, at Deloitte, whether it's in the corporate world, whether it's in the creative world? Yeah, so I, and this is something I feel like is a very consultant perspective, but I feel like every challenge is also an opportunity. And I try to think of it more as opportunities. So, I do think like some of the things I see as a woman is maybe potentially being underestimated, but I think there's an opportunity there where there might be less pressure for you. And, you know, I think that everybody responds to quality. So if you are able to provide a quality product and prove to someone that like your work is really good, whether you're a male or a female, they're going to respect that and they're going to be willing to um, do business with you. So for example, when I was in Hawaii, I was uh, on this boat on this snorkeling excursion and I was saying to the captain, and this was just for fun, but I was saying to the captain who was an older man, like, hey, would you like ever let me do my drone on here? And he was like, just by looking at you, no. So, so I was like, well, actually I'm FAA certified and I do drone work professionally. And he's like, okay, well, like, like if you feel confident and it's safe, then like I would love to have you come out and drone. So I think like like you have to be comfortable like taking someone's initial first opinion if it's not necessarily the way that you want to be perceived and kind of helping shape that a little bit in a sense. Um, and that is one of the reasons like I did get FAA certified is because not just for like this gender disparity, but um, because I wanted people to understand that I take drone work really seriously and actually like know the regulations and a lot of the information that goes into like a drone flight um, and not just like a toy I got that I want to use. You really have to play like the cards that you're dealt. Like I think that every uh, person has something that they bring to the table that's a little bit different and you have to work to kind of understand what you bring to the table and then use that to your advantage to figure out, you know, the best way to accomplish your goals. So, cause I see a lot of people and I have a friend who's in the music industry and she's always saying it's such a male domi dominated industry. Like, I don't feel like I'm given the same chance, but I also feel like if you flip that around, there's an opportunity there, especially in the current movement where people are really interested in having fair representation you know, where you can be unique, where you could be a leader, like one of the women who actually bring more women in. And so if you're thinking about it in terms of that opportunity, then I think, you know, that's that could be really exciting for you. Uh, so I think like the process of flipping things around to see it as less like, oh, that's not advantageous to me to what is the advantage or opportunity there that I can, um, <laughs> you know, ride along with, I guess. I see a common theme in kind of your success is that you 
you see challenges as an opportunity to succeed, as an opportunity to go where no one has gone before and, 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 and take that, turn that into an advantage. Um, so I want to ask you, you know, women typically don't go into the tech field. Uh, a lot of advocates are advocating for women in tech, right? Women in tech, they're trying to push for more, uh, push for more women to go into tech fields. Is this something that should be pushed? Is this something that, you know, we should push more women into tech? Or should we just let women do what they want to do? Uh, what they kind of are gravitating towards naturally? Yeah, so I have so many thoughts on this. I'm glad you asked this question. Um, I think that we should encourage women and let them know what they're capable of and let them guide their own path. So for example, one thing that and i have a lot of like male friends and like family and uh just people like a lot of men in my life that i feel like i've got to observe some tendencies that i do feel like differ between like women and male upbringing so for example i feel like um when growing up like men are often and it really depends on the family of course it depends on the environment and the people but like as more macro trends I personally in my life have noticed that like men are often told, oh, if you don't know how to do that, like go learn it. And like the responsibility is really put on them versus a woman might be, it might be more acceptable for her to just ask for help. So what I think that ends up putting into the person's mind or like the way that they approach things is I felt like a lot of like men are much more like willing to go out and find the answers or like just try something because they're not expecting anybody to tell them how to do something. And I think that like culturally, and even for me, I have experienced a lot of instances where people are really willing to offer me help or like tell me how to do something. Um, and so I think when you're talking about something like tech, which is really new, sometimes it might be where like that, kind of cultural upbringing of like men being expected to just go and learn how to do something might kind of filter in there where it's like they're less intimidated by something new that they don't really understand and just going to go and try to do it versus like uh if you're kind of looking for something that's more like uh guided that might be something like a little barrier to entry in some way if that makes sense so i think like that's one consideration and then i also think um that a lot of um let's see i'm trying to decide how i want to like articulate this thought so i think that um i do think also like when it comes to equipment and tech men just seem to be a little bit more interested in that but i also think that when they're growing up they're pulled into projects that might use that more so it's kind of exposure related for example if there was ever a light bulb in my house broken my dad was not like oh talia you're gonna learn how to fix this um it was like he was gonna fix it but i feel like i've seen um like when i'm with like other guys their dad be like hey like or, you know, whoever they're working with, like, hey, come over, like, help me fix this or learn how. So I feel like there's that kind of hands on learning that, like, gets kind of brought into the upbringing that would make them more comfortable with tech and with, like, other things like that. Not to say that there aren't, like, a lot of women who are into tech or brought up, like, helping uh, fix things around the house and whatnot. But my personal experience was that, like, wasn't necessarily something that I was expected to do or really did on my own. I feel like what you're saying is it is nurture more than nature. But yeah, is the solution for to encourage more women to be in the tech fields to start when they're young, like, like really young, like really four years old, five years old, is it to to nurture them from that age and then going forward they have an advantage at you know college level or is it look let's let's do this in high school let's do this in middle school what do you think is 
the best answer? Yeah, I think exposure, the earlier exposure happens, the better. Um, I also think that um, women being like introduced. So for example, like uh, I'm trying to think, and I don't know some of the statistics behind me, which I would love to know more of the statistics before diving into this answer here. But I think like encouraging women and saying like, hey, data science could be a possible route for you. Like, what do you think about that? You know, and letting them try that on. I do think that people gravitate towards something where they see role models in or where they see other people that they respect and admire doing. Um, so I think for women, like one of the first steps is, you know, featuring other women that are already in the fields doing those type of things, but then also just encouraging them and like leaving that open as an option. Um, Cause it would, I would be curious to know like how many women are, you know, told like, Hey, like, have you ever thought of looking at data science as a career? I actually think that's happening more and more now. And I think we're seeing more women enter that field. Um, but I like on the, on some of those topics for like education, I feel like I might need a little bit more research, but I do run um, like I'm working on a pilot with the Seattle public school system for more consulting and business side of things. Um, and we are basically starting a, a goal-based mentorship program with students to expose them to consulting careers early on. Because one of the issues that we're seeing is um, like Deloitte as a company is very interested in having a, divor di <laughs> a diverse workforce. But one of the issues is when uh, w where we're recruiting from is typically college students with the degree in business. Um, and a lot of the candidate pool might not be so diverse. So then recruiting a really diverse talent pool might become a little bit more challenging. So our question was, okay, how do we make the candidate pool more diverse? And so that's when we started going back into students that were a lot younger high school, middle school would be great, but we're not there yet. We're more certain at the high school spot um, to let them know what consulting is so that if they want to, they can make that choice um, to start on a path towards it. Because the thing about, I think things like tech and consulting is there are barriers to entry that if like for consulting, for example, if you don't go to college, you're probably not going to be a consultant because that is the way that we recruit. Um, and a college degree is really necessary for that. So um, if a student is in high school, we still have the opportunity to impact them and you know let to help them decide whether or not they want to go to college, which could then make them mean that one day they're part of our applicant pool. So in terms of your question on, you know, how to influence more women to get into tech, I do think it starts early. And I also think it just starts with fair representation and promotion of the skills. So showing men and women uh, in promotional materials or like if there's a video of like what the job looks like, men and women are equally re represented in that. I think that would be a great start. Do you have any words of wisdom for women who might be interested, uh, who might be inspired by your story? Yeah, I think that if we're speaking in terms of kind of, especially looking at this from a gender angle of like women, how do you especially dominate more male dominated, more male dominated fields? Oh, one word of advice is to think about men and women as people with goals and understand what goals other people have and help them achieve those goals. Because I think regardless of whether you're a male or a female, um, if somebody is offer offering you an opportunity that is exciting and something that can help further you along, you're really interested in working with that person. So I think, you know, if you are a female trying to break into a male dominated industry and maybe feeling like you're less valued by your male peers, then I think if you think critically about what their goals are and how you can help them with your goals, they're going to really respond well to that and be more helpful and welcome you in. Because at the end of the day, like that builds trust, it builds relationships. Um, 
speaking as someone who has been in like very male dominated working environments where sometimes I'm the only female, especially when I was in mergers and acquisitions, because I switched from mergers and acquisitions at Deloitte Consulting to the strategy and analytics healthcare space. Um, there is sometimes that feeling of like just gender interest, like overwhelming the conversation and it's a little bit less engaging or less comfortable maybe than if I was in a group of women. But I think again, you can turn that and you can decide if you like that or not. And maybe you don't like that and you need to figure out how to encourage other women to join the team or get more involved. Um, or maybe you can see it as an opportunity to learn more about a topic you might not be that familiar with. Cause I actually feel like I picked up a lot of knowledge about kind of interesting things um, being in really male dominated working environments where, you know, they're all chatting about things that like, maybe I don't know so much about, um, cause I'm not really focused on the sports, uh, game that they're talking about, which was sometimes the case, like sports was a really common topic, um, things like that. So I think just going back to like what the advice is, is just to see people, or see the genders as people that you can help. And I think whenever you are helping people, there's gonna be a lot of good that also kind of comes back in a karma type way to you as well. So that's like a, a big tip. The other tip I think I have again is to flip oper or flip challenges into opportunities. Um, Cause I think there's a lot of power in being the only woman in a room too, especially if you embrace that power. I want to know what is your favorite piece of tech that you own? I think maybe my most unique tech that I have is probably this Aura Ring. I feel like it's something that not a lot of people have or would really think of when they think of technology. But to me, it's a symbol of being able to optimize my health with the help of technology. And I think that that is really cool and something that's going to branch off into a lot of innovative spaces over the next couple of years where we're going to look back at this period in time and just wonder how we ever got by kind of similarly how we look back at the 1900s and wonder how they survived before anesthesia and vaccines and uh, antibiotics and be like wow that was horrible i feel like we're going to look back at this time and think something kind of similarly um but i don't quite know what it is we'll be like i can't believe they did it that way <laughs> Um, I, I, I've heard about the O-ring before, but I use my, uh, my Apple watch is still charging right now, but, um, I use my Apple watch to track my sleep. I use an app called sleep track, uh, sleep, sleep, something, mm -hmm. sleep tracker or sleep, nothing. So is there, am I missing something, uh, by not having the aura? So I think that's a good question. And I actually have quizzed my team. My team has about 70 people on it. I sent out a survey to everyone. I lead little health workshops where I talk about how to optimize your health with the team um, because I don't want us as a team who works on healthcare solutions to lose track of the vision of bringing that into our own lives. I think it's one of those instances where we actually want to pull what we work on into our personal life. Um, and so I, one of the questions I asked was, if you have a wearable, how does that data impact the way that you view your health or the actions that you take for your health? And the responses were really varied. So I think it depends a lot on the person and the way that you track and what you do. So I actually think it matters less which tool you use and more about consistency and the analysis, like the understanding you have of your data. So for me, I really like the Aura Ring because I feel like it's extremely accurate. Mm. Um, both in terms of like the sleep that it tracks, I feel like it really matches my mood and it kind of, wow. it tracks your, um, the like length of time you spent in every sleep stage. And so I really like that feature. It also lets you tag each night of sleep with the different tags. Um, and they give you a lot of built-in options. And so every morning I go through and tag, and I feel like that's a very good way when I extract the data to be able to say, okay, which I haven't done um, in a while, but I'm planning to once I get to a certain amount of days, cause I only got this like five, four months ago. So I'm still kind of in the initial stages of tracking the data. So then I'll be able to go out and like really analyze like, okay, 
when air conditioning was on, I slept so much better. So for me, this is kind of like a cool tool to be able to actually like kind of dig into trends that might help me sleep better or not. Right, to um, optimize your sleep and yeah. kind of use all the data points to fine tune yeah. the different uh, variables, right? Yeah. But I think you can also do similar things with the Apple Watch. Like I could, I look at like what the Apple Watch says compared to like what my ring says. My ring usually tracks a little bit less time that I think it like knows when I'm like waking up. Like I feel like it does a little bit better job of like understanding when I'm awake versus when I'm sleeping and actually yeah. tracking the sleeping time. I think the biggest takeaway I had with the Aura Ring was that time in bed is not t necessarily time asleep because I was like, oh, I'm sleeping eight hours. Like I feel really confident. And then when I got the Aura Ring, I was like, oh, I was asleep for five of those hours. And I actually started realizing like nine to nine and a half hours in my bed meant I was getting that seven to eight hours of sleep. But I started noticing like the crazy change in my mental health and my uh, like emotional stability, just like sleeping extra. I felt so much more creative and like less irritable and just like ready to go every single day. Right. So for me, like having that realization, like, did I need a ring to do that? Maybe not, but it was really helpful for me individually. Um, and like different pieces of technology, like maybe the Apple Watch, someone would have that breakthrough with. Um, for me, right. the Aura Ring was what kind of gave me that breakthrough. So where can our viewers see more of your work? Yeah, so if you want to see the travel content, you can find me on Instagram at Talia Grace. And if you're interested in future of health um, or AI content, you can find me on LinkedIn where I post a lot of articles um, at Talia Haller on LinkedIn. Well, there we have it. This is again, this is your host, Victor Chu, and hope to see you in the next one. Bye.